What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Gaming Without Parole. Sitting across from me, as always, is Desiree. And yeah, sitting across from me is Brian Paul. Hey, still no catchphrase. I put that. That's fine. Sitting across from me. That's you no. Know, it doesn't have to be amazing. No, no. I, I don't have a catchphrase. Right. And you don't have a catchphrase. No. Boogity boogity. Our, our personalities are enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try one out every week. <laughs> boogity boogity. Uh, so we boogity boogity. Yeah. <laughs> we had a, a set schedule for uh, gaming without parole, and we yes. were you know tackling t- topic after topic. You know these really socially uh, important. We had the next six months issues. planned out perfectly. Totally. And, oh, yeah. and then something tragic happened. Well, I don't know if tragic is the right word. The man was. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it's it's unfortunate. It's, we it's we sad. suffered a loss. Yes, the gaming industry as a whole suffered a loss. Yes, important member of our community. Yes, uh, Masaya Nakamura. Which, if that name doesn't ring a, a massive bell, don't be too shocked because he's he's not really a, a brilliant designer of video games. He's not, not a, someone. Yeah, exactly. He's not. He's not a. He's he's not a. He's not a Mario guy. <laughs> that would be Miyamoto. I think you're thinking. <laughs> Otherwise known as Mario guy. Oh man, I don't think laughing is the right response <laughs> to the loss of. Uh, anyway, but yes. So um, oh, horrible start. Masaya Nakamura was the founder of Namco. Right. Which I, you know, it was one of those things that did, I didn't really realize that. You know, kind of hit my news feed today, and I sent a text to Brian. I was like, "We have to talk about this," yeah. because as much as you know, Nintendo and the Mario guy are super influential and Sega and all these other companies that you think of right off the bat, Mm. you know, Namco is one that somehow kind of falls through the cracks, but really is crucially important to the video game industry. Yeah. Super duper important. Like, especially, especially when you go back and you see uh, like the foundation they helped build as far as arcade games go. Mm. uh, And then they weren't like this game developer that, that were there at the beginning and then fell off a cliff and you never heard from again. Yep. Uh, they they were there and they were always on the cutting edge of technology and they were always bringing us like new exciting games um, especially on the arcade front but then you know of course the uh, as pow- as consoles get more powerful uh, they kept you know bringing all that stuff home the best they could. One of the things I talked about doing when we first saw this was like oh you know what might be fun. I know it's going to be a long list but it might be a nice little bit for me to just sit there and print out and read a list of all the Namco games that have ever come out. Wouldn't that be funny? Nope. Uh, I made that list. I actually made myself a nice little spreadsheet and put all the uh, the games I could find from various sources. It ended up being 10 pages long, over 700 entries. Now, to be fair, this is like counting separately the same game that came out for different consoles, but still, uh, almost 40 years they've been in existence, uh, releasing games, more than 700 titles they've put out. And as and when Des brought this up to me, uh, the first thing I thought of was, well, yeah, they might be there might be some ports and stuff to different uh, consoles, but uh, especially back in the earlier days, like in the eighties, mm-hmm. which we're going to talk about extensively today, maybe overview today. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- you couldn't you couldn't just bring a game home like it didn't it the arcade con the ar- difference between arcades and home consoles. Oh yeah. The power was just too different. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times what you'd get at home was drastically, drastically different uh, to the point where, uh, I mean, a lot of games are almost unrecognizable as the same game. So yeah. that, how many, 700 roughly? Uh, yeah, like 700 and, like 738, I think is the final number I came up with. So even though a lot of those were ports, like, like I said, we were getting drastically different games uh, yes. depending on the console. Absolutely. Uh, just before we dive into our, our list of games... Mm-hmm. Uh, what we do on the other podcast is oh, yes. uh, every week we do video game true and false. And our new false. thing is that if you send us a list of uh, video game true or false uh, mm. twice, twice we're going to have to up this That's number it. because twice. it just keeps happening. Uh, we, we're going to sign a, a, a Without Parole Games coffee mug. That's your yeah, first yeah. time seeing this, right? Ooh. Your face is right. on it. Yay. I stole your face and that didn't like give you permission. Control. Oh, that's my face. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah that handsome Uncle Lard there. Uh, yeah. for, for some reason, uh, this is something you guys want. We're, we're going to sign the mug on a show. We'll sign. The mug. We'll get the rest yeah. of the signatures on the Midnight Gamescast. Uh, but, Des, if you would be so kind to sign this for sure. Coco the Poop Dog. Coco the Poop Dog. Absolutely. Um, the, my design for this coffee mug left much less room for signatures, but, but at least you get awesome low resolution pictures of our faces. They're a little blurry. They're kind of fuzzy. Make my face. Oop, not today. I must have shaved. I'm really bad at this vamping thing. Every time you, just, you stop talking, I just start thinking about 
The Thanks Mar- for playing. The Mario guy. The Mario guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hatsune Miku. No. <laughs> Shigeru Miyamoto. Uh, yeah, all, all my video game um, knowledge. Oh, uh, look, that, that looks pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Especially with the oh, it's all black and whites and stuff. Black and white. See, I like, like that. that. I think, because now I actually had a specific place to sign. The other one was just like, where am I going to put my name on this? Now, right. boom, it's right there. I'm going to make sure I sign it before the other two can. That way, yeah, they have to take find, up the whole. Yeah, they'll have to sign on the inside of the handle. Which is also black. I'll get a white marker. Moving uh-huh. on, however, because we do have a show to do. We do. Yeah. Would you uh, like? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I was just gonna say, um, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, Namco in the '80s. Uh, specifically, we're gonna stick to kind of like the arcade games. Yeah. Because uh, that's where they made their mark. And for for younger viewers or for kind of older viewers who may have forgotten, like arcade games were so crucially important. I mean. Now it's just you find like some cheap mall somewhere might have like four or five arcade games, you know, in, a, in some old scary closet, or you'll have a lot of retro kind of places. Um, like my scary closet? But you might, oh, you have the floorboards. Mm-hmm. Everything's I, scary around the yeah. area. Uh, I just wanted to put something in context. Like in 1982, at the height of the video game market, here's some numbers that I picked up while we were doing research on this. The video game industry grossed eight billion dollars in revenue eight billion eight billion dollars and this is eight billion dollars in quarters right this was you know you play a game arcade game you put in a quarter eight billion that's insane so that means 32 billion quarters right wow I wonder, was there a quarter shortage around the United States? No, that's actually something else that came up. There was a myth um, that originally uh, started in Japan about the 100 yen, which was the, the equivalent of the quarter, and the U.S. that arcade games were so popular that they ran out of quarters. Well, that's not how money works. <laughs> um, you put the money in the arcade game, then the arcade guy takes the, those quarters and puts them back to the bank, and the bank puts that back into circulation. So, yeah, it's not like you put the quarter in the arcade game and it munched it up and... That would be awesome, though. <laughs> right? This is this is how I live. I feed on quarters. <laughs> feed me, Seymour. No, uh, I'm all over the place today. Yeah. Come on. Uh, <laughs> um, but for if you have so many arcades mm-hmm. sucking in so many quarters, yes. there is that a whole allotment of quarters or hundred yen, yeah, being occupied. Like, so they, they're not just in circulation all the time. They're being, you know, I'm, they, yeah, I'm but sure the yeah, arcade don't. owners don't go to the bank daily. Oh, yeah, but then... Well, maybe they know, do. Yeah, you know, the kid I, I, goes to the bank to get the quarters, too. So it's, yeah, yeah. they don't okay. go away. I was saying there, there could have yeah. been, like, at least a, a plausible origin of the myth being like, oh, sorry, we don't have any quarters. That arcade next door, actually, take them all. So I couldn't find this inf- information in the U.S., but actually in Japan in 1981 and 1982, they actually produced less 100 yen coins than they did in... 1980 and they're They're trying to shut down the arcades. <laughs> um, and just for some context on that 8 billion, so that's, I mean, we're throwing numbers around here. Yeah. That was twice as much as the entire music industry made in uh, 1980, uh, 1982. Sorry. The music industry made about 4 billion. Hollywood movies uh, altogether grossed $3 billion. If you add up ticket and television revenues of the NBA, the NFL, and the NHL, for that year, it's less than a third of what arcades made. But what about the future UFC? Uh, didn't exist then. That's why I said future. It was just a little glimmer in the young Brock Lesnar's eye. Um, and this one, this one totally threw me. That's twice as much as all the casinos in Nevada made in that year. Wow, it's crazy. Um, but, and, you, and as you told me earlier, this. Does not include pinball machines. And this is not, yeah, this is just video games. It's crazy. Uh, in, by 1982, there were over 400,000 individual places you could play arcades. I'm not going to call them, you know, or places you could play video arcade games. Right. You can't really quite say arcades. Um, and this actually threw me. So, 400, there were 400,000 Pac Man machines alone. Wow. They cost $2,400 each. So if you wanted to put a, you know, you wanted your pizza place, uh, you wanted the Pac-Man in your pizza place, you need to pay $2,400, which in today's equivalent is uh, $7,400. Man, inflation's crazy. I know. It costs seven grand. So the equivalent of seven grand to put that in your machine and 400,000 people decided, yes, we need to do that. It's We really can't overstate how important arcade games were. 
okay, at the time. And now arcades just gone. It's, just, it's a curiosity. You know, um, there's a chain out out in the West Coast called Nickel Nickel that's fantastic. I wish we'd come out here. Hmm. Those it's great. You you pay like and like fifteen dollars or whatever to get in, and then all these machines of your childhood are only nickel to play. That's um, so. If you've got one of those local, actually, you know what? That'd be something leave, fun to leave in the comments. Yeah. If you have a fully functional, like decent arcade in your area, throw throw them a link down here. Show them some love. Let us old guys go go and uh, have some fun. Yeah. Anyways, we miss you, arcades. We do. We do. We do. Uh, so the first game I wanted to talk about, obviously we could talk about Pac-Man. I mean, you don't get more important culturally or more influential than that. Um, uh-huh. There we are, Pac-Man. Yay. Uh, I am going to talk about something almost as influential. You know, we try to keep these lists to things we really loved and have a passion for. I'm going to scooch that over a little bit and talk about Pole Position. Oh, it's my favorite yeah. genre of game. It, it really is, actually, because the Pole Position game pretty much created the modern racing game as we know it. Yeah. Um, there were a few car racing games before that. Turbo uh, comes to mind, but Pole Position was the first one really to be that uh, uh, that, that third person, you know, looking de- back at the camera. Not really fully 3D, well, not even close to fully 3D, right. but what they did was actually shifted the vanishing point back and forth on the on the um, the horizon, so it actually looked like you were making the corners, and they animated the vehicle so you could see the wheels turning and see the body of the, the car move. Um, it, it's so impressive that these kind of games were around before, like even sprite scaling was a thing. Yes, yeah. Well, this is raster graphics, right? Yeah. Um, also, it actually took four processors. This this little bad boy, four processors. Uh, three, <laughs> I, I wrote this down, three, 3.072 megahertz processors and one 256 kilohertz processor. So it's quad what, core. What a beast. Yeah. Um, a, a whopping 256 by 224 dot resolution. <laughs> uh, but that's not, you know, that's not really what it's about. It was, no. um, the game was designed by Toru. Iwatari, Iwatani, sorry. Um, he was the guy who created Pac-Man. Oh. It was the most popular, yeah, uh, so knocking out the hits. Most popular coin-operated game of 1983. So how come he's not as popular as the Mario guy? And, and please, don't don't give me shit in the we comments. Know, we know what I know who Shigeru Miyamoto yeah. is. I, okay. Can have for some, humor! Right, we can have some fun humor. here. Uh, but yeah, he's not, he's not well known. No, I, and he absolutely should be. Yeah. I mean, the guy who created Pac-Man, that alone. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Galaga, Pac-Man, uh, Pole Position. He's got dozens of titles to his name. He should Galaga be... too, huh? Yeah, and it's like, again, it was kind of something we came up when we were talking about this. Why isn't, like, Namco in the list of, like, you know... Upper well, echelon, yeah. like, Nintendo influential yeah. type people. Uh, companies. So Pole Position had a few first. Well, I want to get through. Uh, it was the first one to actually be based on a real race course. Uh, it was called the Fuji Speedway in Japan. Uh, it was the first one to have a qualifying lap. So before you could even race, you actually needed to do a qualifying lap and hit a certain time. Uh, it's also the first game to use 16-bit microprocessors. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I, I didn't realize that either, which explains why the graphics were so crazy good for its time. Uh, and also, it was the first one, well, no, it was not the first, but one of the most blatant uses of product placement in the game. The billboards that were going by? The billboards you go by, absolutely. What was uh, on those? You know? uh, in the J- Japanese version, it was Pepsi and Canon. Wow. Um, now, Namco designed the game, but in North America, Atari was the one that actually uh, they published, it? published it and released it. Huh. So uh, oh, because there, there was the Atari logo on the billboards. Yep. I, and uh, 7-Eleven and Dentine as well as Centipede and Dig Dug were on the billboards in the Atari version, which were actually replaced two billboards that were in the Japanese version. That The American market said, yeah, we can't have these. Uh, Marlboro and Martini and Rossi. I love that. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. The Americans were like, yeah, we can't have that on ours. Uh, <laughs> one last, and this is, you know, my, my, my Dez's nugget for the day. So Namco was like, you know what? We don't want to deal with the American market we're going to find other people to publish these games for us. And they went to a little company called Bally ah. and said, Hey, Bally, we have these two games we're looking for a publisher for. Um, we have this racing game called Pole Position and this other real fun adventure game called Mappy. Which one do you want? <laughs> and Banda and uh, Bally said, We'll take Mappy. So it's, 
And I'm going to say, well, you know what? Well, I guess we'll give this other thing to Atari. I mean, not not to criticize Bally's uh, decision because I I would have chosen Mappy as well. Yeah, I like Mappy. That was the wrong choice. Well, I mean, far. from a business standpoint, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, who wants this little racing game? Yeah, um, it's yeah. You, know, you really can't overstress how influential this is. And again, like we're going to be talking about a lot of these games, yeah. it was ported to everything. <laughs> so you can play this on the Wii Virtual Console. You can play this on your phone. You can play this on everything. So yeah. I put it on the Commodore 64, which when we go into the, when you talk about the early ports, yeah. Bleh. Yeah. Well, I mean, I well, yeah, I guess I didn't know how bad it was compared to the arcade right. version because uh, when I was a kid, I didn't get to go to arcades. Right. Okay. So yeah, the Commodore was my ex- my exposure to a lot mm-hmm. of these games, uh, and and I know Pole Position Two. Yes. Oh no! Now I'm getting games confused. I'm just gonna move on. Yeah. So let's just move on. So Pole Position, very important. Good job, Namco. I could sit here all day and wonder about what games I'm thinking about. Did you make a thought it, bubble up here? No, I'm wondering if it's on the TV behind me. If I oh. figured it out, will it be there? Probably not. Oh Brian, you've gotten real <laughs> lazy with your editing lately. <laughs> Shame on you, sir. Shame on you. I <laughs> I wonder what's going to be there. I don't know. I hope it's not the green screen. Like lightning bolts hitting does. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> one of the games I wanted to talk about, uh, and it's going to be such a build-up that just watch the gameplay as I, as I do the build-up. Because, uh, is this there yet? Drum roll. Is it there? I've been told I can't have the table anymore, so drum roll. If it's on purpose, you can. No. <laughs> there we go. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's not that you're not allowed to. <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah. It's that it gets annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Everything just explodes. In no the one background. uses headphones on this, I hope. So let me set up, because the people watching already know what game this is. Okay, if, I'm, if they're I'm familiar I'm familiar with it. Let me set up this, this elaborate story for quite a simple game. Okay. In the kingdom of Mitgult, a serpent demon named Zawel escapes imprisonment imprisonment after a thousand years and kidnapses and kidnapses kidnapses and kidnapses the Miyamoto. Mario guy. <laughs> Princess Alicia. Is this ringing a bell yet? Um, Blaster Master? No. No oh, good guess though. Not Namco. <laughs> you can limit it to Namco. Uh, oops, I just went to a different picture. A soldier named Amul is chosen to rescue her and destroy Zawel. He points his sword skyward and transforms into a powerful blue dragon. Get it yet? Frogger. Nope. Also not Namco. Also not Namco. (laughs) Nope. He can breathe fire and drop bombs, as well as collect up to 13 additional powers during his journey. Amul must fight nine of Zawel's mightiest beasts, one at the end of each stage before facing Zawel himself. This, this is just like video game true or false. Dig Dug? I would have said this is fake. No, this is this is Dragon Spirit. Drag- oh, okay. Because you turned into a Dragon Spirit. I mean, I've I've played this game since hmm. the 90s. Right. <laughs> uh, I didn't know there was such an elaborate story. I yeah, didn't well, I didn't know that the dragon I was controlling was a dude. Yeah, um, but that's kind of typical for arcade games at this time. You don't have a whole lot of plot. There's a, well, the plot's happening and it's up here. It's very well, and this actually, and this actually speaks to something we were talking about earlier. I'm like, I'm like, man, we've got a lot of games to talk about, but we don't actually have a lot to say about each one right. because they're arcade games. Like it's, it's almost like, mm-hmm. um, and I, I know, I know this happened a lot, uh, like in the Nintendo era. You, there'd be a Japanese game developer. Mm-hmm. Somebody in the U.S. would pick up the publishing rights. They'd buy yep. the game and bring it over, and they'd get the game code, mm-hmm. and they'd get no information about it. <laughs> so, so here they are, like sitting there, and they were like, like, look, playing the game and being, okay, well, what's the story here? Right. And they just make it up. Like the the stories, yeah. oftentimes in the U.S., were just dramatically different than the someone real... set us up the bomb. Yeah. Wait, what is that from? Remind me. This this one you can make fun of me for. Oh, credits. There we go. Uh, comments. Yeah. Okay. Zero wing. All your base are belong to us. Well, I knew I knew that quote. Yeah. That's the same game. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Cool. So, Dragon Spirit, Dragon Spirit is a We're 19... old. So old. Oh, God. Congratulations. I remember memes before they were called memes! Do you know what congratulations is from? No, I don't, actually. The ending of Ghostbusters. Yeah, on the NES. Okay. Oh, okay. It's like, it didn't even spell congratulations right. <laughs> um, they didn't think... I mean, come on, I only saw that screen once. Yeah. Yeah. 
1987 vertically scrolling shoot 'em up. Now, can we just put something to rest here? Can we not call them shmups? Shmups. Do you call them shmups? Uh, I try not to think of them. I. They're my least favorite genre of game. Really? Yeah. Oh. Not, 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 not a big fan. So like bullet hell, all that stuff doesn't appeal to yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, shiny. Well, I'm not a huge fan of shmups either. Shmups. So I'm never going to say that word again. Shmup, 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 shmup. I'm going to start hitting the table every time. <laughs> um, but, but this, for some reason, spoke to me. when I'm, I remember I played it. Strangely enough, not on the Commodore 64, mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, post college and I started to like, you know, I had a real job and I Ooh. could start actually for the first time in my life uh, collecting video games. Okay. Uh, I got real obsessed with the TurboGrafx 16, uh, which is known oh, as sorry. the PC Engine in Japan. Yes. Uh, and that is hands down, like if I had to get rid of my whole video game collection and keep one system in games. Really? Oh, absolutely. Huh. Yeah. Why? I'll just be taking these then. <laughs> I will charge you at the <laughs> door. Um, yeah, it, the PC Engine was amazing. Uh, Turbo Graphics didn't get a lot of the great Japanese ports uh, because it was kind of a failed system here. Yeah, uh, but we got Bonk. We did get Bonk one, two, and three, and Zonk. <laughs> way more important. <laughs> uh, but we get we got Dragon Spirit. We didn't okay. get the sequel, Dragon Saber, uh, which is still exclusive something uh it they came out in japan pc engine okay yeah so you are this person but you're actually a dragon i'm Wu. and for whatever reason this really did appeal to me so because you, you start off and it's pretty simple as you know most shoot 'em ups begin fairly mm -hmm. basically they want right. they want to get their hooks in you uh before they get ridiculously hard yeah uh, although it is still fairly a hard game and the reason for that is is because you're a dragon sure you have these big Flying wings. Ooh, that's like extra target space, isn't it? Extra target space. So your hitbox is pretty oh, darn big to begin with. Yeah. And on top of that, as you progress through the game, you can get power-ups. And the power-ups will give you double and triple firepower. And the reason they do that is because you get a second head or a third head. Oh! You know this game now? Now I remember that. Okay. This game. Yeah, because yeah. I don't see that. Yeah. But yeah, all right. Yeah, that was cool. It was cool, that but was, the, but then that also increases right, increase the size hitbox. of your hitbox. Uh -huh. uh, so it's it's just one of those things that like the designer giveth, the designer taketh away, <laughs> right? Uh, so you, you do you fly and you and you, sh and you shoot and, and you drop bombs, and uh, so you're right. constantly dealing with like the ground enemies uh, mm -hmm. and the the enemies in flight, and then there's even some that like go from being underwater and shoot up and take. Did flight. this come up for NES? It did come out for I, NES. That must be where I played it then. Okay. Yeah. All right. The weird thing is, is they actually considered the uh, the NES version mm -hmm. uh, like a pseudo sequel, but it's practically identical. Okay. I don't. I don't. There must have been some kind of like publishing Change plot here or thing there, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like, well, it has to be a sequel. We got the exclusive rights for the yep. Turbo Graphics. So, it's for whatever reason a great game, and it actually translated well from the arcade to home. Even the NES yeah. port is pretty good. Yeah. Strange. I, I, yeah, I don't remember playing this in the arcade, so I must have played it on the NES. And yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, not not a whole lot to say about this mm -hmm. one, uh, outside of the fact that it's it's strangely addictive for being in a genre that I'm not terribly excited about. Yeah. So that's my yay my little. Uh, it's the schmuppiest schmupp of all. I hate that word. I kind of like it now. <laughs> so uh, speaking about uh, incredibly difficult games. We're going to talk about one that, as I was scrolling through the list, immediately just, oh my god, I have to talk about this game. Rolling Thunder. Oh, yeah. Yes. Right on. Uh, it came out in 1986, so mm. we're kind of on the, the far end. Well, released in Japan in 1986, uh, released in the U.S. on Nintendo Entertainment System in 1989, so we're right on yeah, the, you just the last made it. Yeah. Squeezed right in there. Uh, you play as Secret Agent Albatross. Really? Oh, yeah. That's, that's his name, Albatross. Yeah, no wonder why this didn't take um, off. This, yeah. yeah okay, plot. Uh, <laughs> World Crime Police Organization. Uh, you're a member of the Rolling Thunder Espionage Unit. You're, there's a female agent named Lila Blitz who's been kidnapped. Blah, 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 blah. Hmm. Things that are really important about this game. In some ways, you could say this is one of the first games. Well, it's, oh, right, it's a side-scrolling shooter. Um, it's one of the first games to have a cover mechanic, really. Basically, as as you're walking through, there are all these doors, and you know when I was looking through, I was like, "Oh yeah, Rolling Thunder doors." Yeah. 
Because what you can do is if someone's shooting at you, you can go into the door. You can hide in the door. Yeah. Um, inside the doors, there are also, uh, you know, power-ups to your gun. There are more bullets on the doors, cleverly labeled, labeled bullet. I just love the idea. You're walking through this warehouse and like, okay, there is room 113. Oh, there's the bullet room. Yep. So let's open that up. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, you can also kind of jump from down from one level to the other. Although if you jump down and there's no floor, uh, instantly die. Which brings me to the next point. This game is freaking hard. Mm. This is insanely hard game. This is back when, you know, they didn't want you to succeed and have fun. They wanted you to get hooked and die. Right. So you throw in another quarter. Uh, if you get touched by one of the bad guys, the uh, the, the maskers, <laughs> they're actually called, you can get touched twice and then you die. If you get hit by anything else, uh, bullets, projectiles, grenades, any environmental hazards, instant death. So get touched twice or hit by anything else, instantly dead. The thing I remember most about this game mm-hmm. is how tall and skinny the main character was. It was tall and skinny, so nice big hitbox. Yep. And also uh, Castlevania-style jumping. So you jump, you can't change direction. Mm-hmm. And if, say, an enemy pops up, well, you're just going to get hit. Uh, the the skill in the game wasn't necessarily just being able to fill you know shoot everything up. It was basically in memorizing the attack patterns of the enemies and yeah. saying, okay, now this guy's going to come through here. Uh, there were two different stories, each with five stages, and the second story things got real weird. Uh, instead of just having these masters jumping around, you had these sort of animal men and panthers and sort of like these lava kind of creatures coming up. Yeah, it's it's set in sort of a sixties spy sort of world but then all of a sudden this all this bizarre creatures and the light starts coming after after you um and and so the second story would just begin as soon as you beat the first story yeah it was basically it wasn't yeah it was a, a just a continuation of the same plot i guess the other weird thing is every time you beat a stage and this is you know not being too stereotypical but come on jimmy Han, you gotta deal with this your reward for beating a stage was to get like cutscenes or images of your uh, uh, Layla, Layla Blitz, in captivity or being tortured. So, thanks, Japan. Um, Love it. Other th- yeah. Oh, the other th- thing was a little weird. And this, if none of this has sparked a memory of you, you might remember this. You had one gun you started off with, your pistol. Mm-hmm. You could upgrade to an assault rifle, which was after you're going. Pew, pew, like made you feel like a god finally you could just you know fire death upon your enemies for a little bit if you ran out of ammo with your assault rifle you went back to your pistol if you ran out um ammo on your pistol you got back to the uh what do they call it the uh uh, the chaser gun which is basically you could fire one bullet at a time it was this very slow bullet so annoying <laughs> so it was basically you know i don't want to say survival horror quite but you really weren't giving a whole lot of ammo and you had to use it sparingly and you had to avoid things this is a hard ass game and i still remember it very fondly so yeah uh <laughs> absolutely i think another uh commodore 64 port for me yeah uh the, oh the, there was um and this is kind of interesting a company called tengen localized and released in the u.s yep totally unlicensed without nintendo approval yeah so uh, actually i think that happened to a lot of namco's games yes uh, it seems I to have, be a very uh, common theme yeah i have uh, i have a pac-man cart pac- pac-man pac-mania mm-hmm. rolling thunder uh yeah there was a se- whole series of them yeah. at one point actually namco was responsible for 40 percent of nintendo uh sales that's insanity yeah must have been yeah. earlier days i'm guessing yeah but very early days but yeah. So forty percent of all video games sold for Nintendo Entertainment System were Namco titles. Wow. At one point. Damn. You know, I know this isn't a Namco title, but for some reason, I always get, I always get Rolling Thunder confused with Codename Viper, and I know I can actually okay. picture the two different games. Yeah. But there's that whole I think the the same mechanic of going indoors for cover. Yeah. I think that's there. I think, um, yeah, I think that might, but I think um, I might kick myself later. Rolling Thunder actually it. predates it though. Oh, because, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of there was like a lot of uh, copying I think going on back in the oh, day. Oh yeah, it was like oh that's a great idea. We're just gonna use that in our next game. Well, this thing with the arcades making so much money. I mean, it was really like oh we can get we can buy a circuit board and slap some graphics, or we can just take your really successful game and slap some new graphics on it. Hello, Miss Pac-Man. Right. Um, oh, I hate you. Yeah. That's right. 
We had to we had to get it in there somewhere. In, in some ways, it was kind of a better game, but. Oh, I, but think, yeah. I think everybody agrees Ms. Pac-Man was the better game. Yeah, but yeah. it was totally a rip-off. They just literally took Pac-Man and slapped a bow on it and called it a different game. Then Lawyers happened. Lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Lawyers didn't prevent my next game from being made. Okay. Splatterhouse. Splatterhouse. Splatterhouse is, I mean, one of the very early... Hmm. Right? I mean, it's an right. appropriate name for sure. Yeah. I uh, This... Th- it just goes. It gets so much credit for being such an early, gruesome game. Mm-hmm. You know, like for when systems and arcades and they couldn't actually portray like blood and guts too realistically. Right. Uh, Splatterhouse managed to do it back in 1988. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you play, you play this guy Rick, and I'm sure like if you're unfamiliar with this game, then oh my god. But um, you're, prob- well. you're probably more familiar with the 2010 remake for like PS3 and 360, yeah. uh, which is. I think severely underrated. Yeah. I had a lot of fun with it, even though it wasn't that great of a game. Uh, which, by the way, since I don't want to actually talk about the remake anymore, I will just say, uh, in that game, Splatterhouse 1, 2, and 3 were unlockables, which I feel like isn't done cool. as much as it should get done. Yeah, actually, I was looking at that. There was, there's a lot of name code titles that are unlockables all over the place. Like Star Fox actually has some, um, I think, uh, uh, oh gosh, Xevious. I was I was looking in the original Star Fox. There's a way you can unlock Xevious. I wonder how. I wonder what the uh, what the deal is with that because Star Fox wasn't developed or de- it was actually by Namco. Namco Namco didn't develop it, but they assisted in the development of it. Didn't know that. Yeah. The original Star Fox. Mm-hmm. I, wow. Okay. Uh, unless I, I misread what I was reading, but yeah. I learned something today. Mm. Okay. Uh, T I L. What does that mean? Today I learned. Uh. Uh, t- t- T-M-K-Y. T-M-K-Y. Yeah. The more you know. Ah. Yeah, I didn't just edit that in. That's not <laughs> happening. Although, maybe I could probably put that commercial back there. That's probably legal, right? We go off the rails more than we used to. I That's like right. it. That's okay. Yeah. Good. Makes up for not doing research. <laughs> uh, 1980, 1988, Splatterhouse was one hard game. Hmm. Uh, again, same thing that was true with, uh, with Dragon Spirit was that you had like this big character with big hitbox. Now, the other problem with this is that you're kind of a slow, hulking character. It's just like everything looks like, slow and methodical. You're moving through this uh, house. Mm. Uh, a splatter house. A splatter house. Uh, basically, you're, you're this guy named Rick. Okay. And your girlfriend, Jennifer, has been kidnapped. Like you do. Like you do. Uh, a lot of kidnapping going on. I, I mean, the storylines yeah. for all of these games... They're the same thing, just copy and paste. Yeah, you know what? The, uh, Lifetime of Video Games prepared me for kidnapping being much more a part of my daily life, but it really isn't. Yeah, I, I mean, rescuing princesses so far has not been part of my daily routine. No. Other than said video games. Maybe once a month, but certainly not daily. On on occasion. Yeah. Uh, now, the reason I the reason I, uh, I segued with the lawyers mm-hmm. is because Rick, your main character here. Hey, Rick. Yeah, who does he remind you of? Since you can't see, I'll tell the you. The Incredible Hulk? No. Well, I did say hulking. The leader? Um, he reminds everybody of Jason Voorhees. Oh, I remember this now. Yeah. Yes. And so much so that <laughs> even in, in Japan, the yeah. the main character, Rick, has the white hockey mask, mm-hmm. right? And even the same similar clothing, like the jumpsuit clothing. Right. Right. And uh, in, in Japan, things are a lot more loosey-goosey as far as uh, copyright laws are concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get away with everything over there. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then over here, somebody stepped up and was like, "This isn't this isn't going to happen." Yeah. So they changed the the mask from white to red. Whew. Apparently, thank God. Apparently, that was enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Rick looks just like Jason Voorhees uh, with a red mask. All right. So, whoever brought that suit, you have the worst lawyer ever. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it was a suit more than like a more like a warning or a. Because uh, yeah. there was no. I didn't find any evidence of it actually going to well, court. Change his mask to red. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. You know. Now it's a blood mask. Okay. Uh, don't ask me. It's just All a right. thing. Um, so what I what I don't like about Splatterhouse, mm-hmm. the, well, mostly are the slow, deliberate controls. Because really, like, if something comes at you, like, you punch, and it's like, boom. And you're like, all right. It's not that slow, but it is It is slow. The whole thing just feels clunky. And it's 
and again, it's it's to increase the difficulty. It's to get yeah. you putting those quarters in the machine, yeah. but it just it just makes the whole thing really difficult. And so, in a lot of your enemies, uh, some of them are slow and have the same issues. Mm. But uh, at the end of the very oh, first level, issues. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the very first level, you're in this poltergeist possessed room where like things are flying off of the shelf and things are flying at you like knives and like things and mm-hmm. chairs and and you got to jump to avoid them and you got to kick them or punch them to at the right time and it's definitely difficult yeah it's and you can't do it your first time like this is like one of those things that you like the more you do the better you get at it mm-hmm. but it's not one of those things that you actually want to get better at yeah you know that's uh but getting back to the gore part of it um it, these enemies do literally splatter like there's a in the right. ho- and at least the home version it's a two by four but in the arcade it's a, a meat cleaver uh in the first two levels you can find one and just pick it up and and swing it at the enemies and man they yeah because you're walking on a 2d plane like you don't get to go up and down like you do in like final fight or something okay. uh, so even though it's a brawler it doesn't really feel like one because you can only really take on one enemy at a time mm-hmm. uh so uh when you swing this two by four at your enemy they go flying against the back wall and kind of explode in a pile of guts. So it's a very cool visual effect. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope I timed that right. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of like decapitation and just like blood and guts and gore. And it's, uh, they really took this game as far as they could. I remember being a kid and having a Sega Genesis. Now, Splatterhouse 1 mm-hmm. wasn't really a thing. Like, we, if you didn't go to the arcades, like, you had no idea what this was. Right. Because uh, it never came home to like Nintendo. Right, not in the states. Yeah, uh, I don't think that would fly very well. No, uh, but it did get again a uh, 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 PC Engine port, and uh, and it did come to the Turbo Graphics sixteen. Oh, which is crazy. It's it's just strange to for the Turbo Graphics to get like you know the exclusive yeah home rights to this game, <laughs> uh, and it was it was actually a really really good port. But now I. No one, no one had a Turbo Graphics growing up, except for you, Mickey Gustafson. Um, yeah, right. He had everything. That kid was cool. I miss you. <laughs> so I had a Sega Genesis a little bit later, and I remember being in a store in my hometown and seeing the box for Splatterhouse Two, like mm-hmm. up on the wall, and being like, "Man, Splatterhouse Two! I bet if I was allowed to play that game, it would be super That's cool. That's gonna be twice as gory, right? But like, it was like be always. I always saw it in the same place in the store, and I never got to even like look at it because it was always like behind the counter and yep. stuff. And and I know full well my parents were very strict about what I what I could play with the special magazines. With the special magazines, it was back behind the counter with the special magazines. Yeah, kind of. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sort of <laughs> that same deal. Uh, out of reach for a kid, at least. Yeah. Uh, so when I finally got my hands on this, I was like, "This is everything I ever wanted as a kid." But as an adult, I didn't have the patience for it. Yeah. Yeah, um, on the front of the box on Turbo Graphics 16, uh, there was a warning. It says the horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children and cowards. <laughs> Ooh, I like it. Playing dirty. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the 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 blood and gore and everything pretty tame by today's standards, mm-hmm. but uh, but at the time pretty revolutionary. Yeah. So uh, so way to go, Namco. Yay. Slowly desensitizing the population, one gamer at a time. Long before the M rating ever existed. This is Yay. very true. Yeah. Yep. You're up. So I've got one one honorable mention. We're talking about uh, things that are difficult, things that are uh, uh, really didn't port very well, and things that are, you know, I guess sort of important to the history of gaming. At the beginning, we mentioned Pac-Man. We weren't going to spend a whole lot of time talking about Pac-Man, but I am actually going to kind of cheat a little bit for my, my honorable mention uh, and talk about Pac-Mania. <laughs> oh no, not that. This is I think probably the first time I've been massively disappointed by a game. I remember <laughs> specifically seeing this in an arcade when I was a kid. It was um oh gosh, where was it? It was we were in Maine. Um no, we were in New Hampshire, big arcade. And I'm like, "Oh wait, that's that new Pac-Man one that's like 3D." And it yeah, was an isometric view, which was Pretty revolionary. I think like Zaxxon had oh, that. Yep. Um, uh, like a couple Zaxxon. other games at, at the time. Like, wow, it's like 3D. Then you play it. And first of all, you see Pac-Man as a character model does not work in three dimensions. He looks really weird. It's kind of this like slit sort of opens up in his face. and Yeah. yeah it's, it, that's not great. It's creepy. But it's super creepy. I mean, as you look at him from the side, he's just the, you know, 
Nothing. Wah, wah, no, wah, that's wah, that's wah, great. Wah, 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 wah. Uh, you don't have to think about like how his facial structure works to make that happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's a pizza with a piece missing. The other thing is like, holy crap! Now you can actually hop over the ghosts, <laughs> which is great. Except they introduce two no- new ghosts that hop at the same time as you do, so they're impossible to hop over. <laughs> They're, they're great ghosts. Um, but not all of them hop. Just not two. all of them hop. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also, it's super slow. <laughs> like, even the arcade version was just, you know, one thing about Pac-Man, it's it's quick. It's, you know, it's it's quick reactions. you got to turn around, ah, and freak out. It's just kind of plodding along. And, you know, the, the, the hardware at the time was just not ready for what we were asking it to do. Also, on top of all that, Pac-Man stayed stationary in the center, and the screen moved around him. Oh, that's funny. I don't remember that. Yeah. Oh, I, man. I, I hadn't really thought about that closely until I was reading about it. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So you stayed, you know, the, your sprite stayed stationary, and the rest of the screen moved around you, which was just one more extra layer of disorientation. Um, I don't know. It's just it's my honorable mention because... It's one of those things I completely forgot about mm-hmm. until I saw this. Like, oh, this was such a horrible experience. I need to share it with my audience. So you're welcome. Well, and the name Pac Mania uh, also like brings up like we were talking earlier about how uh, how like Pac Pac Mania literally like not it not was the, actually a thing. not the game yeah. like yeah Pac Mania the craze mm-hmm. like swept the nation like, absolutely like before Mario. Yep. Whatever, whatever that guy's name was. Mario, uh, Mario guy, Marty, Marty, sure, Marty McMario, <laughs> um, uh, son. He, uh, this, this Pac Man was a thing. Like, I mean, I had roller skates with Pac Man on the side of them. There was a Pac Man cartoon. Was it Saturday morning? Who knows? Yeah, there, yeah. there was a Pac Man cartoon. Although that actually came out a few years later. But and who was the band that did the Pac Man songs? The Great yeah. Big Dead or something? I don't know. It was it was Hippies. huge. Like as as big as like Batman was. You know, with the the original Tim Burton Batman was. I mean. It absolutely took over the culture, which is weird because now it's not really there. I mean, people know what Pac-Man is, right. but could you, I mean, really, could you go find a Pac-Man backpack right now? Let's see, Pac-Man Fever song. Who? Um, you know, and, and whereas like Mario, um, you know, Sonic even, they have this cultural existence still, even though they're, you know, gaming-wise haven't been as influential i mean the next mario that came that comes out isn't going to change the way games are made from there from now on but pac-man did and for whatever reason it had its one little spike in the late 80s and then poof yeah it's pretty crazy and namco has continually tried to milk that cow and find out you know there's been pac-man kart racing games there's been pac-man rpgs there's been pac-man uh uh well, you name it. They, they've tried it. And yeah. it's just nothing else has ever stuck. There's a Pac-Man puzzle game. Uh, yep. There was... Uh, actually, in, in, in all Pac-Land. fairness... Wasn't it Pac-Man? Pac-Land was horrible. The yes. 2D side-scrolling. Uh, oh, that's my what I God. And there was a sequel that mm-hmm. was even worse for the NES, yep. uh, Super Nintendo, and Genesis. He doesn't have awful. legs. Stop giving him legs. Yeah. Uh, but I will say this. Pac-Man World, I believe. Mm. PlayStation 1, and then the sequels were on PS2 and GameCube and stuff. Uh, those were good yeah like they they actually for me i mean there were three of them so they must have succeeded somewhat uh they actually broke into the 3d character mascot uh territory Mm -hmm. and fairly succeeded okay i I was i was actually fairly impressed so for a brief moment in time i thought they were having a great comeback yeah and then uh yeah then that was over again sorry puck man oh puck man puck man Uh. (laughs) and for my honorable mention uh, this is I, I had to find the strangest game I could possibly come up with. Um, it's not hard in this time of uh, not at all experimentation and yeah. But this is a uh, uh, Valkyrie no Densetsu, and this is uh, exactly it is a Legend of the Valkyrie. I think it translates to okay. Yeah, you play your main character. You play as this uh, warrior maiden. Valkyrie. Nope. Strangely enough. What? Nope. I know. Right. She was. Uh, but that's what it she came. She is. came. I know, but she came from the heavens and was, and was named after Norse Norse mythological Valkyries. Okay. I know, right? The, I, if I read you the storyline for this, you'd be even more confused than the dragon spirit one. All right. Uh, but let's just move on. In the arcade, this came out in 1989. So I, I, I am cheating a little bit because the way I played it's it. It's the 80s. No, but I'm cheating because the way I played it was 1990. On. Oh, that's right. The PC Engine kids. Hey. Love it. 
Uh, I've heard that before somewhere yeah. recently. <laughs> I'm obsessed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right before you took over the co-host duties, uh, Mike Zeller and I did a two-parter. A two-parter? Yeah. I think it was maybe a one-parter. It was supposed to be a two-parter. Okay. On why we love the TurboGrafx-16. Uh, and then maybe we, ne- we never got around it to it. It did have the, the coolest engine. cartridges. Oh, like the credit yeah. card things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so cool. Yeah, I still think they're cool in SD cards I know, like I, this big. I remember the, the, the first one I saw in... Um, in the real world, I was actually Mickey Gustafson's that, house. No, that's no. right. <laughs> some some kids I babysat for, and that, that was like that was the perk. It wasn't actually making any money. It was like, oh, I get to go and play with their Turbo Graphics So you yeah. knew one person as well. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. it's real weird. Uh, so yeah, so this is this is strange because if you play this game, yep, right. It it was sort of their take on Zelda, like the original okay. Legend of Zelda. Uh, that's what it. All right, and that's a very cursory, very simple. Uh, uh, analysis of it it wasn't it it's not an open world like zelda is you didn't get to just like have free reign of the map you, okay yeah you it's is each level played out way more linear but there were all these branching paths which made you feel like you were exploring oh. an open world except that's not really what was happening you kill enemies and they explode into a pile of coins and you get to pick up those coins and go buy stuff yeah. uh so there were some you know rpg mechanics even though it was like a top-down um action pseudo rpg Okay. Yeah, to an extent. Uh, I I love this game. I, I've only played it in Japanese. Oh. There are virtual console ports, which I don't know if they translate uh, things from Japan on the virtual console. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is real nice because you actually have to know uh, Japanese language. You have to answer specific questions in Japanese. Ooh. Uh, and I think it's actually the questions are even about Japanese language, which is real strange. That could be a problem if real. you don't speak Japanese. Right. <laughs> uh, and there are, vir- if you are a virtual console fan, uh, I think on the Wii, there are ports of both the PC Engine version and the arcade version. Oh. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Okay. Compare so, and contrast. Exactly. So uh, for a very not well known game, it's it, work, yeah. it, it's gotten around. Was it a bigger hit in the in Japan maybe than it oh, was? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And actually, this game, the one I'm talking about, is a sequel to a Famicom game. So thank you. Uh, so what are your favorite Namco games of the '80s? Uh, obviously, we we man, we sh- went through a lot of titles to pick the ones we picked. Yes, there are so many more so if we didn't talk about your favorite one we apologize we almost certainly didn't talk about your favorite one but we we didn't talk about it on purpose just to piss you off yes that was our goal you, and so make sure you comment below you know and let are. us know what your favorite one is uh also comment below and let us know uh what future ones you'd like us to talk about because we have not recorded those episodes yet yeah what, what are your favorite namco games from the 90s and the 2000s uh we want to know and seriously, if you know of any uh, classic arcade places in your area, mm. throw, throw a link down there because we'd like to uh, check some of those out. Also, if you know the name of that Mario guy, we'd really greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Barry? It, it is Barry. Barry Gustafson. Barry, no, that's the guy. for gaming no, with Nolan Bush now. I quit. <laughs> for Gaming Without Parole, I'm Brian Paul. And I'm Des. And we'll see you next week.